Welcome back. Our next topic, after modernist and traditional city design, is the cluster of ideas represented by the term green city design, which means integrating natural landscape into the designs for cities. Some people prefer to call this process landscape urbanism. Most pre-industrial cities were small, and the natural landscape was always close by. Modern urbanization covers big areas, so that the relationship of the natural and constructed environments becomes more and more difficult to achieve and more and more important. Climate change is introducing a new factor. What had always seemed to be permanent is beginning to change visibly, and cities will need to adapt. Rising sea levels will be an important issue, as so many cities have grown up around seaports. Adaptation means learning new ways to reorganize the natural environment. People can create new conditions that will evolve into natural systems over time. We know this is possible because people have been modifying the environment since the beginning of agriculture, maybe 10,000 years ago. They have also dammed streams to create lakes and dug canals for irrigation and transportation. China, beginning in the 5th century BCE, the time of the Parthenon in Athens, began building a great system of canals that still exist today. The West Lake at Hangzhou is an artificial lake whose history goes back to the 7th century AD. It was consciously designed, as you can see, as a serene and beautiful landscape. The city of Hangzhou forms its eastern side. Chinese gardens for individual palaces and houses have long been designed as artificial landscapes, and this tradition spread to Korea and to Japan. This is the garden of the Katsura Palace in Kyoto, where 11 acres of land have been reorganized to create a complete landscape beginning around 1620. The garden is designed to display different vistas as you walk along the paths, and as you contemplate the garden from inside the house. Chinese, and by extension, Korean and Japanese concepts of garden design, became known in Europe through landscape paintings, views of gardens on Chinese plates made for export, and from drawings and maps made by travelers. European landscape paintings, like this painting by Claude Lorrain, were also an influence on European garden design teaching people to appreciate landscapes from well-chosen vantage points. The inner gardens at Stowe, a great house in England, were redesigned starting in 1715 as a series of natural appearing landscapes. This form of landscape gardening was later called the picturesque, meaning like a landscape painting. But it is likely that much of this design thinking came from China. This map shows the gardens at Stowe as they had developed by 1777, according to designs by William Kent. It's never possible to reconstruct just what ideas influence a designer, but we can make informed guesses. We know that Kent had access to a set of drawings of Chinese gardens in the library of Lord Burlington, for whom Kent worked as an architect and landscape designer. At Stowe, we can see that organization has strong parallels with the way landscapes have been remade for centuries in China, Korea, and Japan. If you follow the paths in your imagination, you can see how the vistas change, making the gardens seem much larger than they really are. One of Kent's assistants at Stowe was Capability Brown, who went on to design many more artificial landscapes for wealthy estate owners. Here is just one of the garden vistas at Stowe. As in China, the landscape is punctuated with small buildings, although a different kind of architecture. As cities expanded, they sometimes grew around existing country estates, some of which, as in London, were preserved as parks. But bigger and bigger cities became more and more removed from the natural landscape and it became clear that people needed some relief. The reservation of Central Park in New York City was a major step in bringing what appeared to be a natural landscape into a close relationship to the surrounding streets. Frederick Law Olmsted's design is completely artificial, but it has grown up to be a functioning landscape, which is just as effective today as when it was planned 150 years ago. Olmsted also planned a series of parks in Boston, often called the Emerald Necklace, again a constructed environment, which as it matured, became a natural landscape. Here is part of it today. As cities become more and more industrialized and farther removed from the country, parks no longer seem to be enough. People began to ask themselves why they couldn't be in touch with nature all the time without, of course, moving back to the farm. One of the most important people to think along these lines was Ebenezer Howard, who published a book in 1898 entitled Tomorrow, A Peaceful Path to Real Reform which he later retitled Garden Cities of Tomorrow. Here is a diagram from his book. Howard wanted to create what he called town country, a mixture that would deliver the benefits of city living 
along with the fresh air, greenery, birds, and animals to be found in the country. Rich people have their country estates and their summer homes, but Howard was interested in the lives of ordinary people. His ideas included building green belts of permanently preserved countryside around city centers and decentralizing new communities into satellite towns themselves surrounded by green belts. Howard actually succeeded in organizing the development of two prototype garden cities, and today green belts and satellite towns have been constructed in many places, but seldom according to Howard's complete comprehensive vision. A parallel development was the creation of garden suburbs where people could live in a continuous landscape environment. We have already seen one of these garden suburbs in an earlier presentation in this course, the Country Club District in Kansas City. Here is another garden suburb, in fact an important prototype, designed about 100 years ago by the architect Grosvenor Atterbury and landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., the son of the designer of Central Park. When the development was new, most people arrived by train at Station Square or by subway a few blocks away, although big houses did have garages and auto access became more and more important later. However, the plan is designed to be walkable with shops and apartments near the station and bigger houses farther from the center. Forest Hills, like many other garden suburbs, has grown into a beautiful environment. Designed originally for moderate income people, the houses are now pretty expensive. Another part of our story is the construction of great works of environmental engineering, which became possible after the Industrial Revolution. The Suez Canal connects the Mediterranean to the Red Sea and onto the Indian Ocean. It opened in 1869. It is a sea level canal, so the waters of the two seas now can and do flow together. Instead of having to sail around the southern tip of Africa, ships could sail directly to India, the East Indies, and China. The Panama Canal was built through much more difficult terrain. It opened in 1914. It needs a system of locks to allow ships to be floated up in stages to higher elevations. They are a more modern version of the locks on the Erie Canal in New York State that we saw in an earlier session in this course. The effect of opening the Panama Canal was to greatly shorten the distances between Asia and the east coast of North and South America and also created a new connection to Europe. The two canals together have made a huge difference to world trade. Work began on portions of what is now the St. Lawrence Seaway in 1871, but the whole 2,500 mile long system was not completed until 1959. It enables ports on the Great Lakes in the US and Canada to have a direct connection to the St. Lawrence River estuary and thus to the Atlantic. This is one of the locks along the seaway. Environmental design and engineering also made it possible to correct some of the mistakes introduced into the city by industry and by misguided use of elevated highways and railways. A river in Seoul, in South Korea, had been covered over and made into the right-of-way for an expressway. Recently, the expressway was taken down, the stream opened up to daylight again, and a landscape park created along the stream banks. This should be a forerunner of landscape restorations and improvements which are needed in many other cities. An elevated freight line in Manhattan that had outlived its usefulness has been turned into an elevated park on the model of a comparable park development in Paris. The invasion of cities by elevated railways and highways can be corrected either by tearing them down or by turning them into landscapes. Another highway mistake has been corrected in Madrid where the highway along the river has been lowered into a box and the top has been landscaped. The result is to restore connections between the neighboring parts of the city and the river. The environment is constructed but will develop into a park landscape over time. Adaptation to changes in the climate is going to be another factor that makes city designers pay closer attention to natural forces. This is not a canal. This is the entrance to the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel in New York City after Hurricane Sandy. New York with its subway and highway tunnels is especially vulnerable to storm surges, something everyone understood could happen and now it has. New Orleans was supposed to be protected from a Category 3 hurricane, which is what Katrina was when it hit. But the flood wall protections were improperly constructed and gave way, and the pumps failed. It took a long time, but the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers admitted its responsibility after the story was long gone from the front pages. Katrina has made people in many coastal cities ask themselves what would happen if a similar storm hit. A huge amount of money has been put into protecting New Orleans from the next storm. It still may not be enough, but New Orleans is now the only vulnerable U.S. coastal city to have flood surge protection. In England, after disastrous storms in 1948 and 1953, a barrier was erected in the Thames River, downstream from the main part of London. It took some 30 years to organize and build it. Since it has been in operation, 
It has been used frequently to protect London from flooding. There are plans to enlarge the barrier by 2030 because of rising sea levels. The barrier rests on the bottom of the river and is raised mechanically when a flood tide threatens. It can't remain in place like a dam because water is also coming down the river in the opposite direction. Venice is a city that has been vulnerable to rising waters for a long time. A set of gates to protect the bay where the city is located ex is expected to be completed soon, maybe next year. The gates will operate on similar principles to the ones outside London. The situation of Venice on lagoons behind a barrier beach is similar in many respects to communities along the New Jersey and New York shores that were badly damaged during Hurricane Sandy. The same storms in 1948 and 1953 that caused the construction of the Thames Barrier caused the Dutch to begin a whole series of mechanical barriers called the Delta Works. This is an aerial photo of the largest of them, the Eastern Scheldt Barrier. When a flood surge threatens, the gates come down and create a dam. As in London, the dam can't be permanent because it would hold back the river. Rotterdam, perhaps the most important harbor in Europe, is protected by two huge swinging gates, which can be closed, as shown here, when a storm surge threatens, or, as in this photo, just to make sure the mechanism is working. Here is a diagram showing how the system works. St. Petersburg in Russia is now protected by a system of dams, gates, and locks that allow ships to pass through. This construction is twice as long as the Eastern Scheldt Barrier. While they were constructing this protection, the government also put a six-lane highway on top, completing the ring road around the city. Boston could have a protection like the barriers being constructed outside of Venice. New York City has studied what could happen after a direct hit from a Category 1, 2, or 3 hurricane and posted evacuation instructions on the city's website. The orange area of the Category 1 ring is a pretty good prediction of what actually happened after Sandy. Here is a close-up of the maps, which shows that the damage could have been much worse if the storm had been stronger. Don't take the subway if you are evacuating one of these areas before a storm. New York City could benefit from a Venetian-style barrier or a Thames-style barrier systems, or maybe both. There's another barrier that would also be needed, which doesn't show in this diagram, to guard against waters coming in from Long Island. Here's a speculation about how to protect Miami. The biggest problem in the San Francisco Bay Area may be protecting the San Joaquin River Delta from saltwater intrusion, as it is the source of drinking water for a large part of California. It's not just U.S. cities that need to think about storm surge protection as sea levels rise. Think of Hong Kong, or Shanghai, or Rio de Janeiro, or Sydney. Some people say that you can't fight nature with mechanical barriers. In the long run, they are correct, and we will soon have to start thinking about migrating some coastal developments, particularly the seaside estates of rich people. However, perhaps we will be successful in heading off the worst scenarios of global warming and coastal cities can be adapted to stay where they are. Our next topic will be system city design, which includes new computer-aided technologies which can help designers prepare solutions to complicated modern problems like climate change.